Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. Hello, I'm Marina Yevshan, co-host of the Russia-Ukraine War Report podcast, and today is March the 22nd, 2024. It has been 3,707 days since Russia started covert military operations in Crimea, 10 years and 31 days since the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, and 2 years and 28 days since Russia expanded its war of aggression. Today's podcast looks at events that happened from Wednesday to Friday morning. During the podcast you will find the Russia-Ukraine war map helpful to visualize the areas discussed. A link is in the podcast description. The Russia-Ukraine war report is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from our direct contacts and journalists in Ukraine, the Russian Ministry of Defense, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine Morning Reports, Operational Commands North, South and East of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geospatial experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian male bloggers and social media channels with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission, the truth, because the truth matters. Here is my daily assessment. 1. The largest missile and drone attack of 2024, which targeted Ukraine's energy infrastructure, was emboldened by Western inaction, which created an environment that encouraged new breaches of the Geneva Conventions committed by Russia. 2. The preordained election of Vladimir Putin has cemented his rule for life as a de facto dictator, and he will continue to dismantle 70 years of political and social reform from the Soviet and post-Soviet eras. 3. Free Russian Liberation Forces have established operational goals in Belgorod, and with the announcement that they are continuing their insurgency, are committed to their achievement. 4. Ukraine is systematically targeting Russia's oil refining capability to cause economic harm and degrade Russian mobility. 5. The United States House of Representatives will not advance a bill that will provide additional financial and military aid to Ukraine, unless there is an unforeseen event that changes congressional leadership before the 2024 elections. 6. The inability of congressional leaders to agree on additional support for Ukraine is worsening European instability. It will ultimately encourage further acts of aggression by the Putin regime within and beyond Ukraine. 7. Based on statements made by Russian President Vladimir Putin and his proxies, and the actions and inactions of Ukraine's allies, the world remains in the early stages of the mutually assured destruction and stability paradox. 8. Ukraine's air defense capabilities will be in a critical state by April due to a lack of munitions as demonstrated by declining missile intercept numbers. 9. Russia maintains the initiative theater-wide, but the second phase of the 2024 winter offensive is reaching its culmination point. 10. Ukraine's shift to a Fabian strategy to wear down Russian combat power has been effective. 11. Russia has significantly improved its intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities ISR, and fire control enabling more successful attacks against mobile targets. 12. While the possibility of an intentional nuclear accident caused by Russian occupiers at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant remains low, the condition is more serious than what the International Atomic Energy Agency is reporting. 13. Russian-aligned assets have co-opted the ongoing Polish border blockade, which has become an open act of hybrid warfare against Ukraine and the Baltic states. This is the last day for this entry. We begin today's war report in Kharkiv and Luhansk Oblasts. The operational tempo remains low in the Kupiansk area of operation, or EO. Russian and Ukrainian sources reported continued fighting in the area of Sinkivka, with no change in the situation. On March 20, Russia launched several S-300 anti-aircraft missiles used for a ground attack at Kharkiv, striking a factory that makes a variety of consumer and commercial electrical devices. Five people were killed, including the chief engineer at a business. Seven more were wounded, and up to ten people were still missing at the time of recording. 
During the early morning of March the 22nd, Russia fired up to 20 S-300 missiles from the Belgorod region, targeting power plants, substations and other electrical infrastructure in Kharkiv Oblast. The missiles arrived within four minutes of launch and used a ballistic trajectory, making them nearly impossible to shoot down. Power was knocked out to 700,000 subscribers. Within the city of Kharkiv, power, water, sewer, heat, internet and public transport were knocked out. At the time of recording, there was only one injury reported, but search and rescue operations were ongoing. In the Kremenayo of Luhansk oblast, Russian forces made continued attempts to advance on Terne from east without success. In the Siversko, Russian forces attempted to advance on Belohoryko from the east and suffered catastrophic losses. Four infantry fighting vehicles, two tanks, and five Chinese Source Desert Cross 1003 ATVs were destroyed. Here's what's happening in the Donbass. Starting in northeast Donetsk Oblast in the Siversko, Russian forces attempted to advance into Spirne, suffered losses, and returned to their defensive positions. In the Solidario, Russian forces attempted to advance on Vasele and Rozdolivka without success. Intense positional fighting was reported in the Bakhmutio. Russian forces made new attempts to advance into Bogdanivka without success. Fighting continued in Ivanivske, where the situation is unchanged. In the Klishivka AO, attempts to bypass Ivanivske from the south ended, while positional fighting continued north and east of Klishivka. A Russian assault on Andreevka from the east ended in disaster. One light infantry fighting vehicle rolled over, crushing the dismounts riding on top. The second one rolled into a pond and almost immediately sank. There was only one Russian survivor, who was sitting motionless, covered in mud. We'll link to the video in our situation report, and there is more information in the podcast description. In southwest Donetsk Oblast, Russian forces were able to make advances west of Avdiivka AO by accepting heavy casualties and continued loss of armor. Fighting continued on a line from Berdeche to Semenivka to the western edge of Urlivka, ending at the western edge of Tonenke. Russian forces captured Urlivka and control most of Tonenke. Both villages have been reduced to rubble and will offer little protection to advancing Russian troops. The war map has been adjusted. To the south, fighting continued in Parvomaiske. Russian forces have been pushed back from the southern outskirts of Nevelske, and the map was adjusted. Significant fighting is ongoing in the Vogladaryo. Russian assaults continued east and northeast of Krasnohorivka, east of Georgievka, and on the southwestern edge of Pobeda, with no change in the situation. Fighting also continued in Novomikhailivka. Russian forces made new attempts to advance from Solotke in the direction of Vodyane, suffered losses and retreated. In the Staromlinivka AO, Russian and Ukrainian sources reported continued fighting in the areas of Staromayorska and Dorozhaina, with no change in the situation. In Zaporizhia oblast, fighting continued in the Urikhiv AO. Russian forces continued to try and improve their positions west and northwest of Verbove, while attempting to advance on Robotene from the south and west without success. Overnight, the city of Zaporizhia was hit by at least eight ballistic missiles. The head of Zaporizhia Oblast Military Administration, OVA, Ivan Fedorov, said, quote, The enemy launched eight missile attacks on Zaporizhia, infrastructure facilities were hit, and civilian houses were damaged, unquote. Seven homes were destroyed, and another 40 were severely damaged when a ballistic missile slammed into a civilian neighborhood. Three people were killed, ten wounded, and three people were reported missing, including a child. The Dnipro hydroelectric power plant, located in Zaporizhia, was hit by two cruise missiles. Attacking a dam, hydro plant, or nuclear power plant is a breach of Article 56 of the Geneva Conventions and is considered a war crime. The dam has a roadway that connects the western and eastern half of Zaporizhia, which had early morning commuters on it, including a trolleybus. One of the two dam top gantry cranes were destroyed, as well as the rail system they ride on. Water flow cannot be controlled with the sluice gates in the closed position. The second gantry is intact, but the rail system it travels on is destroyed in several locations. 
a gas pipeline that is attached to the dam was ruptured in two places and burned out of control. The dam remains structurally sound, but the powerhouse suffered significant damage. Power Unit 1 is out of service but can be repaired, while Power Unit 2 suffered a direct hit. It is unknown if it can be restored. Engineers are working to manually open the sluice gates without the gantry, as water can no longer pass through the turbines of either power unit. At least one employee was killed in the attack. The 750 kV power line to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was disconnected due to the Russian missile and drone attack across Ukraine. The International Atomic Energy Agency reported on Twitter, also known as X, that the power line was reconnected after a five-hour outage. IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi reported that the 330 kV backup line successfully rolled over during the outage. Today's missile and drone attack was the largest one to target Ukraine's energy infrastructure since February 24, 2022. Normally, I break out Kherson and the Black Sea area from other regions of Ukraine, but the list of hits is so long, I'm going to include it as one section. In Kherson Oblast, Russia heavily shelled the west bank of the Dnipro from Stanislav to Kherson, striking homes, apartment buildings, electrical infrastructure, administrative buildings and schools. Two people were killed and seven injured. The city of Mykolaiv was hit by a ballistic missile that struck an industrial enterprise. One person was killed and six more wounded in the attack. Odessa was attacked by over a dozen Shahed-136 one-way drones, with critical electrical infrastructure damaged in the attack. Due to a loss of power generation, rolling blackouts have been introduced. In Dnipropetrovsk oblast, the head of the Krivy Rih Defense Council, Oleksandr Vilkul, reported there were strikes to critical infrastructure facilities by Shahed drones and Russian missiles. Residents were advised to collect water and reminded that 213 points of invincibility were open in the city. Hospitals and other critical infrastructures had to switch to emergency diesel generators and rolling blackouts have been introduced. In Poltava oblast, over 113,000 electrical customers were without power. The head of Poltava OVA, oblast military administration, Filip Pronin, announced that rolling blackouts had been introduced throughout the region. Two people were killed and eight wounded in the Khmelnytsky oblast. Search and rescue operations were ongoing and power had been knocked out in some areas. The head of Vinnytsia OVA, Sergei Borzov, reported that Shahed-136 one-way drones and missiles hit a critical infrastructure facility. At the time of recording, no other information was available. The Kirovograd oblast implemented rolling blackouts. The head of Kirovograd OVA, Andriy Raikovich, said, quote, Every two hours, half of the consumers of the residential sector in certain territorial hromadas of the oblast will be cut off from the power grid. In the city of Kropovnitsky, the outskirts of the city will be cut off. Unquote. Critical infrastructure was also hit in the Ivano-Frankivsk oblast. One person was injured, but power to the region was not impacted. The head of Lvivova, Maxim Kozitsky, said that an energy infrastructure facility was hit, but power was not impacted. There was also a small forest fire near Zolochev, caused by a Shahed-136 one-way drone that was shot down. On March 20, Russia attacked Kyiv with 29 KH-101 or 555 cruise missiles, a KH-47M2 Kinjal air-to-surface ballistic missile and an Iskander M short-range ballistic missile, SRBM with all reportedly intercepted. Falling debris, including at least two intact warheads from KH-101 missiles, caused localized damage and injured 13. One intact warhead landed on a Rosetka warehouse, similar to Amazon, causing heavy damage. I was lucky enough to have my parcel destroyed there. There were 99 employees in the building at the time, fortunately with no one injured. Falling debris damaged six schools and several apartment buildings. Another intact warhead was removed from the Shevchenkivsky district. On the edge of Kyiv, 69 homes and five apartment buildings were damaged, some severely. (laughs) 
fighting between pro-Putin and free Russian forces continued along the border of Ukraine. In the Kaliningrad region, the Russian Navy accidentally struck the fishing trawler Captain Labanov with an anti-ship missile during a training exercise in the Baltic Sea. The Russian fishing boat was severely damaged, killing three and wounding four. In the Leningrad region, due to repeated drone attacks, shipments of saltpeter, which is used to make gunpowder, are having to bypass the city. Shipments will be moved to the port of Ustluga, but it must be prepared to support the movement of explosive substances. In the Sumer Oblast of Ukraine, Governor Volodymyr Artyukh appealed for people not to return to their homes, among reports that the intensity of shelling and airstrikes was subsiding. Shelling and airstrikes wounded three people across the region. Russian missile strikes damaged electrical infrastructure throughout the region, forcing rolling blackouts to be implemented in Shostka, Konotop and Sume. The Freedom of Russia Legion, the Russian Volunteer Corps and the Siberian Battalion held a joint press conference, declaring that they would continue operations in Kursk and Belgorod, although the scope is unclear. Prior to the press conference, they released a joint statement that said in part, quote, Our liberation movement once again demonstrated the strength and power of the spirit and weapons of the Russian volunteer and the weakness of the Putin regime. Together with our comrades, we prove to the whole world that Putin is losing control over the situation more and more every day and is no longer able to protect even the borders of his own country. Putin's army was unable to resist us. We call on Russians from all countries and people of all nationalities to join us and fight together against the Putin dictatorship. Only with arms in hand, being together, we will definitely win and create a new Russia, a strong, peaceful and respected country, of which there is no shame in being a citizen. Our fight continues. There will be new victories. Unquote. Here is what we could verify in Bryansk, Kursk and Belgorod. In Kursk region, Free Russia Liberation Forces continued firing on Tetkina. The VKS, pro-Putin Russian Aerospace Forces, bombed the city on March the 20th, raising questions from Russians on why that would happen if Free Russian Forces weren't in the town. In the Belgorod region, a Russian Mi-8 helicopter had a hard landing in Ravinki, causing the loss of the airframe. The pilot was hospitalized and three others were reportedly uninjured. On the subject of things falling out of the sky, over the last two days four Fab 500 bombs have fallen off Russian aircraft onto the Belgorod region. No casualties were reported. Fighting continued in Kozinka, where Free Russian Liberation Forces made new gains. The Russian VKS heavily bombed the settlement on March the 20th. Free Russia Liberation Forces have established full administrative control of Gorkovsky, releasing a picture in the northern edge of the village. There was confusing information about the status of Graivaran. Officials issued a mandatory evacuation order for the entire district, which was deleted three hours later. There were local reports of forced evacuations. In contrast, Belgorod region governor Vyacheslav Glodkov was in the settlement handing out humanitarian aid packages. However, in a post on Telegram, he lamented that three people had refused to evacuate. Belgorod continued to be shelled. An artillery or mortar round struck near the Belgorod Arena, with the closest known location of Free Russian forces 32 kilometers away. In our assessment, it is highly probable that pro-Putin forces fired the round. Governor Gladkov reported one person was killed and five wounded in the shelling. Local residents expressed frustration with closed stores and banks and the declining security situation. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers and analysts is funded by readers, listeners and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News. Here is my theater-wide update. By now, you know there have been two significant missile and drone attacks on Ukraine in the last 24 hours. Here are the facts. I can't make you hear the explosions, so please hear the numbers. 
on March the 20th, 29 KH-101 and 555 cruise missiles, one Iskander MSRBM and one KH-47M2 Kinjal were fired at Kyiv. All the missiles were intercepted. On March the 21st, 88 missiles and 63 Shahed-136 one-way drones were used to attack Ukraine. 55 of the 63 Shahads were shot down, and 37 of the 88 missiles were intercepted. Russia used 40 KH-101 and 555 cruise missiles, 7 KH-47 Kinjal ballistic missiles, 12 Iskander MSRBMs, 2 KH-59 air-to-surface guided missiles, and 22 S-300 anti-aircraft missiles. It is possible that some of the missiles were North Korean-sourced KN-23 SRBMs. The mass attack, which specifically targeted Ukraine's energy infrastructure, was launched just 17 days after the International Criminal Court issued warrants for the arrest of two Russian military commanders for intentionally targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure from October 2022 to March 2023. In our assessment, this act of defiance to the basic foundation of societal rules is due to the weak response by the world to Russian aggression. President of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky expressed frustration with the United States, without mentioning names, in morning speech. Quote, it is important to understand the cost of delays and delayed decisions. Patriot systems must protect Kharkiv and Zaporizhia. Air defense is needed to protect people, infrastructure, houses and dams. The partners know exactly what is needed. They can definitely support it. These solutions are needed. Life must be protected from these inhumans from Moscow. Unquote. Hours before today's attack, Zelensky had asked European Union leaders for additional air defense systems to protect Ukraine. Quote, I urge you to help to protect our cities, Kharkiv, Sumy, Dnipro, Odessa, Kherson, and others. We need to give reliable protection to the skies above the front line. Because if there is enough support for Ukraine, it will show Putin's bodies that there will be enough support even if this insane person orders the expansion of aggression to other European countries. We should not await what Putin has in store for the Baltics or other parts of Europe if we can destroy his aggressive potential now." Unquote. He also condemned weak sanction enforcement, reporting that the missiles that attacked Kyiv on March the 20th had over 1,500 components from the West. Quote, Greater accountability for sanctions circumvention schemes is needed. I am grateful to all states and leaders who are doing this. But much more pressure on Russia is needed. Unquote. On the subject of aid from the United States, both discharge petitions to force a congressional vote appear to be poised to fail. Discharge Petition 9, led by Jim McGovern, has 188 signatures of the required 218, including one Republican. Discharge Petition 10, led by Brian Fitzpatrick, only has 16 signatures. And that's what we know. Your support of my home, Ukraine, helps us make history and protect the future for all. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.